Thank you very much, Mr. Boda, for your warm words of introduction. You said at the start of this morning that I will be talking more about the supply side of things. So my title, Consumption as Design, is something I want you to understand in the sense of how are we designed as consumers. It suggests that we're powerless as consumers. Obviously, I don't mean it quite as dramatically as that, but that's essentially what I want to talk about. And I'd like to begin by saying that in recent decades, the producers of consumer articles have tried to link every activity, every form of experience, every very everyday type situation. They, they examined it to see if they can't find some kind of experience, some intense moment, a good feeling, feel good moment, and if they could link this with what they're making. So the people's lives are looked at more closely in all of their facets than has ever been done before by writers or directors of films. So basically everything that seemed to happen by the by unconsciously is supposed to be then staged by the appropriate product to make it an event and to make it interpretable. So one of the results of this is that for every activity you could possibly do in the kitchen, you can buy special utensils so that cooking can be ritualized and turned into a sort of professional, highly specialized, handmade experience. And of course, there are various different shower gels you might have for the morning, for the evening, before the gym, after work, before you do something relaxing, before you do something exciting, so that a really quite profane event can be upgraded through the variations of products available to a particular meaning or expectation. The same is true for tea, mineral water, chocolate, or cleaning agents. And the same activity is interpreted differently and depicted differently so that it seems almost inappropriate to use the same words for the same event. Thus, for example, what does brushing your teeth have to do with or brushing your teeth with an Oral-B White Pro 7000 by Brown with Bluetooth connection, app support, and programmed by your dentist have in common with brushing your teeth with a bamboo toothbrush made by Manufactum that can be completely compostable, can be composted rather completely. Shouldn't there be two different words, one for the high-tech surveillance tooth management system or dental hygiene management system and a different verb for that sense of cleaning your teeth with the cycles of nature. Design and marketing have created difference where they weren't important before. They organize sensitivities. And in times of a market economy structured culture prosperity, there are countless variations of objects that make it possible for you to perceive and experience more and more finer and finer facets of an activity or situation. The producers of the world of things have taken on the role that poets used to have and language smiths. They create new realities. Reality can be created by either using a word or a formulation to draw people's attention to an experience and make them identify an experience for the first time, possibly, or by making this experience possible in, by the way you deal with an object or commodifying it. For example, if you develop a multifunctional home trainer, you can help the user of a device like this to have a unique body experience and allows them to experience this themselves, even if they spe don't specifically pay attention to it in the lack of attention that you pay to such things in every day. The same thing happens if a writer writes about an experience like this. So the writer Clement Zetz recently started inventing new meanings for old words that have been forgotten from the Grimm Dictionary. And he has a new word in German. It is called Garetzen. And he defines this word that he's made up as when you're stretching in the morning, 
stretching until you get to the point that you suddenly have a sense that you're going to be stuck in that stretched position where on the one hand you're enjoying it, on the other hand you're almost panicking about maybe getting stuck in the stretch position and then you start to quirr, which is his word for it, the greeting purr that a cat gives you when it's first meeting you. So thanks to this description, a particular physical experience comes to mind that many of us may have made very vaguely without paying attention to it. But as soon as it has been named, it is intensified by its definition. And the same thing can happen when you use your home trainer. If you carry out certain individual motions and distinguish them from other motions, writers and designers thus generate diversity and difference. They make reality more real through the way in which they regulate attention. And obviously, we'd like to have more words that Clement Setz could come up with, for example, two different words to describe the two different types of cleaning your teeth that I just mentioned earlier. Now, as much as it belongs to the achievements of our consumer society today to make people nuance sensitive due to the incomparably differentiated culture products that we have here, it is certainly not a historically unique situation. <clears throat> Thus, for example, one can doubt whether or not more intensively experienced things are happening, more differentiatedly we're experiencing things than in times in which poets and thinkers had a monopoly in owning in on semantic potential. However, and this brings me to my key point here, I would say that designers and marketing specialists aren't satisfied with making differences where no differences have been made before. Instead of just creating a need for new words, particularly new verbs, one of their other strategies is the opposite, to make something an activity just because there is a verb to describe it. And this is done because it makes it possible to create new products and new variations of products because this new supposed activity can be and must be practiced, interpreted, and intensified. And I'm going to try and do this on the basis of a particular example. Wohnst du noch oder lebst du schon was one of the most successful advertising slogans, which translates roughly as, are you still residing or are you living now? Are you just living somewhere? Or are you really living? Are you staying in a place or are you already really living there? Something like that. It was a question that IKEA used and it was sort of self-ironic, i.e. suggesting that you could actively live in a place that you might not be doing. But how could living in a place, how could living be an activity like eating or speaking or kissing. I mean, the advertising slogan suggests that living is an intensification of residing in a place that if you're doing, first you do the one and then you intensify to the next level and do that. So it's sort of like an activity you could do like reading or swimming. And I think that's why this slogan was so incredibly successful in Germany. You suddenly realize that dwelling or residing and living aren't activities that can be specified. There are certain activities that could perhaps exemplify residing or living, maybe watching television, playing cards. These are things that can suggest staying in a place, living in a place without being synonymous with it because you cannot live with an activity, you know, I mean, you, you can't buy fruit instead of or as well as bananas, apples, and cherries. So it's a sort of deceit of grammar because it's not the, the case that staying in a place or living in a place is a verb like cutting something, brushing your teeth, or garetzen, this earlier word that we just referred to. So if the IKEA slogan is perhaps playing with this deceit, marketing regularly exploits it. It convinces consumers that living in a place, really living, involves certain specific things. And if you do them, then you are really living in a place, really living. 
And but because you can't do that because you can never live in a place more or less than you do just by drinking coffee in the way that you can drink coffee or make a phone call or something like that. So consumers are left with a sense of unease that they're not doing it right. Maybe they say, oh, I'm good at cooking, I'm good at driving, but I'm not really very talented at living in a place. And even if you spend a lot of time focusing on activities at home, you can't shake this feeling that living in a place is something other than what you're doing. And this is, of course, an advantage for the producers of goods that we never feel that we're particularly successful at living in a place because this way they can keep promising us that we will really succeed in living in a place or residing in a place or whichever level we're at. And so they can sell us more things. And the same paradox that's at the basis of the IKEA slogan was something that Martin Heidegger used in 1951. He gave a lecture entitled Live, uh, Building Living Thinking. So he suggested that living in the middle of building and thinking was an activity just like building and thinking. However, unlike IKEA, Heidegger is not trying to encounter a perfidy of grammar in a tongue-in-cheek way, but he takes this deceit very, very seriously and demands within his lecture that living should be done and experienced with the same totality as construction and thinking, building and thinking. So for him, and that's what these this row of words is supposed to signalize, it's not about separate activities. And with a reference to etymology, he even talks about there being an identity of building and living. From his point of view, though, he sees a problem that living is no longer seen as a dynamic activity in the way that building is. So he complains that living is something that people have forgotten because it's the familiar and hardly even strikes you anymore. But how can it be any different, one could ask. Heidegger says, living has always been a residing among objects. And what he means by object is something that he derives etymologically, the word ding, from versammlung or collection. And he talks in his lecture about an old farmyard in the Black Forest as an example of a former way of residing. And his suggestion is that these, the things that were there are no longer there anymore. But I think his concept of the thing, the ding, an object as a collection is something you can understand. If you think about a candle holder, you know, you look at this candle holder and then you think about what you associate with a candle holder. You think of maybe long evenings that you've maybe spent with your friends, some in intense conversations, good food, red wine, drunk from glasses in which the warm light of your candles are reflected. And all of this is the sort of atmosphere collected in a candle holder. And that's what Heidegger means, means when he talks about a collection. It's uh, maybe one would say a sort of atmosphere is there in these candles. And perhaps Heidegger would then say that in all of these things where all of these different associations come together, you have this sense of living with objects. But if you ignore the objects around you, living is something you forget. But if you bear in mind the rich fabric of association attached to the objects, then you have a sense of really living in a place. So you have a sense that to give living in this sense, real presence, you need two things. You need to have objects that are designed such that you associate a lot of things with them. They become sites of collection where various things are associated. And on the other hand, you need other people who notice and think through all of the association we have with these things. And these things don't happen on their own. They require practice and Heidegger believes that you have to learn how to live with things and the fact that living with things isn't something you necessarily experience on your own but that's being forgotten is something that Heidegger thinks is terrible because you know as a romantic as an anti-modernist it's the symbol of a general loss of reality a loss of being something that he thinks has to be overcome 
And this loss from his point of view is something that's typical of the history of the Western world, which with increasing powers running rampant, trying to experience a climax in the modern technical world, surrounded by objects made industrially and an increasingly fast paced civilization means that people are further away from living than they used to be. What's striking though, is that Heidegger believes that poets can do something to counter this movement. Their power to create significance with words and to make th things that you otherwise wouldn't experience become real again is something he longs for. So the work of designers or architects are not something that he sets out. He doesn't see any rescue in sight in this regard. But other writers like Heidegger have talked about this living in a place and something that you have to do actively So we've got Clement Setz, who comes up with new meanings. But there are other writers, for example, who listen in to existing words and take them very seriously. One example is Peter Hatke, Handke, rather, my attempt at a Happy day, Versuch über einen geglückten Tag. He writes 1991. Should I have spent the whole day at home, done nothing but lived? Just spent the whole day doing pure living, living, sitting, reading, doing nothing. What did you do today? I listened. What did you listen to? Oh, home. So even though poets and philosophers insist on an active, aware experience of living in today's culture of consumers, it's particularly designers and marketing experts who work on this assumption that living is a profession that you have to learn to get good at it, just as you need specific tools to be able to do other professions. Although I think Heidegger wouldn't have liked the fact that special living accessoires are being produced to generate atmospheres of living. I'm sure he would say it was artificial as an expression of pure functionality that manufacturers have carried out market research to find out what the wishes and desires of their consumers are and what they associate with particular aesthetic codes before pr developing their products. On the other hand, we could also say that products in today's world in an excellent way are exactly what Heidegger considered as a thing, namely a collection of associations. There's an enormous semantic density in many of the products that we see, particularly the higher quality products. Nearly every sense is appealed to every material, every shape, every context has been thought through, measured and reflected and for every social milieu, every ambiente, every or ambience rather, every situation, there are optimized product variations that can create a different atmosphere. So there's a different character, a different atmosphere that emerges. I think in 1941, in the time after the Second World War, where there wasn't much money around, Heidegger could hardly have imagined the arms race of the culture of things in a couple of decades later. There weren't any interior designers or designer furniture. And certainly there weren't all of these bowls, clay figures, lamps, kit cushions, Buddha heads, scented candles, vases, pictures, and all the rest of it that you can get in so many accessoire shops, furniture shops, DIY shops. Maybe these are often a peg, though and that objects are designed to suggest to consumers that they do nothing more committedly than live in a place in lifestyle, living magazines, lifestyle magazines, and websites such as Freunde von Freunde.com. You are shown how you're supposed to live. There are all sorts of different atmospheres from a sort of, of pleasant dwelling, from 
cozy to cool, and they're all about inspiring one another and making us think about how we live in a place. Now, how is this impression created that you are living in a place? And how does it feel if you're experiencing living in a place or if you imagine it? How can we see living in a place as being associated with something? as being its own activity. I mean, it's quite striking that a lot of the furnishings and accessoires that are shown in connection with living in a place properly are very present in their materiality. You know, there's sort of wood, concrete, stone, and cloth that are staged, almost offered up to you in a pornographic manner so that your attention is focused on the materials themselves and the functionality is not so important. So wood has to have a rough surface or be split. Stone has to be look as if it's just been hewn. Concrete is unplastered. With cloths, you see individual threads or fibers. Perhaps one could say that the things are revealing their, the fact that they've been made. And it's almost as if they're still in the process of this so that you could continue on. You could sort of file the wood a bit or smooth the wood a bit or straighten a shape, develop a pattern, and the raw materiality almost calls for a finishing. It's sort of an aesthetic of non finito, and this appeals to actively taking it further. And the interim phase allows a sort of room for your imagination. You can imagine what it would be like if you were to somehow lure out the shape that is inherent in a design out more clearly. An impression of non finito also emerges when a product seems improvised, combined out of various different individual components so that you have a sense that you could combine it differently. I think with more expensive companies this is a pref this is, this is a something that they're quite keen on there's a sort of a do it yourself aesthetic as if the aim was to take it one step further and imagine that you could tailor it to exactly your needs at least in your mind so this is true for material even in new products Another trend is a sort of sense of looking distressed, you know, that you have traces of use, types of patina that suggest tradition and a long life, give you a sense of the good old days, radiating a warmth. And these relics seem to have character, and they suggest that you could use them completely differently. There's a sort of room for your imagination to imagine what you might do with these objects yourself. Now, if you think of this definition of objects as a collection of references and associations, then many of these objects that are supposed to be there to make you feel that you live in a place, through it, they, they have sort of associations of do-it-yourself, of hands-on, craft trades, individuality, conjuring a sense of primordialness, naturalness, authenticity, so living is often something that is coded in an anti-modernity way, like Heidegger and Rilke do it. The design theoretician Melanie Kurtz recently showed in a book how an aesthetic of the home made is fed by resentments against industrial types of production. And just as living objects, because of their non finito design, promise all manner of options and thanks to their aura of innocence and freedom can make you happy. In the much cheaper segments, lots of housing accessoires that don't have any clear function can generate happiness. Something that you have to lend meaning to. These style conscious people who know how to live tend to dismiss all of these things as bric-a-brac. 
a sort of projection screen. But the idea is you're, they're supposed to inspire you. You're supposed to imagine all kinds of things that you might be able to do with it. They're supposed to give you a mood of creativity. And what you'll find, I think, is that the word that tends to be used most by these better living magazines, furniture catalogs, and texts by designers is the word inspiration in connection with living. So on the one hand, you're looking for inspiration. On the other hand, you get inspiration. Living becomes a place where you can experience this. You could paraphrase it and say that living means, in today's design culture, being inspired to dynamic, active deeds. You know, a sort of pleasurable intensity is what you're supposed to feel that isn't actually targeted to anything particular, but it's just sort of general. So living means feeling open to do all kinds of different things, to have a sense of promise, as if the most important things, the most beautiful things, the best things were still ahead. So it might sound paradox, but that's why the most important place for living is not actually where you live, but it is the point of sale. Because at the point of sale, you have this sense of anticipation of what's ahead of you, and that's the natural location for it. Even thinking about what you might do with an object, with its material, with its potential functions, is there. You know, the sort of inner film triggered by a product takes a couple of seconds, maybe a couple of minutes, until you make the decision to buy it. And the idea of idyllic living linked to this object is perhaps strongest in the shop, where you have a strong sense of all the promise of this object. Now, in the best cases, of course, this experience is intensified once you get it home. And the inner images that you have can be translated into your life. But what happens far more often is that the new thing is just absorbed by everyday life, and you never again experience it as consciously as you did in the moment when you bought it. At home, you often just don't have the opportunity to reflect on things or your inner images and fantasies sort of disappear. At any point, you may sober up completely. Or another word that Clement Setz uses, he describes this experience that you can have as dingzal, when you go off objects, a sort of silently engaging with objects in hours where you can't concentrate on anything properly, where you have disorders in hanging on to something and then letting go and then finding it again. This is how he defines dingzal. So measured on the initially intensely imagined living that you're going to have, all of these new living objects eventually sort of peter out. And you feel all the same appeals that you used to have of all forms of non-infinito. But once again, you have a sense that you haven't really found out what living truly is. So you tend to live in your imagination than rather than living at home. It's more when you're looking at a, photos of apartments or houses in designer stores rather than in your own living room. But there's one wonderful moment of living at the point of sale that can be extended a little bit. You can extend this experience thanks to one particular ritual, and that is that expensive products with high aspirations of atmosphere often have a delivery time. Until the product is actually delivered, you've got weeks where you can wait for your product and look at your inner images once again, and hopefully they will intensify and further develop. So I think delivery times are actually extremely important. If you were to shorten these delivery times or avoid them completely, the emotional added value of the act of consumption would suffer. And this emotional added value in today's residential objects or living objects approaches a sense of living as being creative. But again, it's a verb 
that seems to be associated with lots of different activities. It doesn't name a certain activity, like, you know, maybe writing or painting a picture, doing some pottery, writing a concept. These are examples of creativity, just as cooking, reading, and knitting might be examples of living. But you can't be creative independently of such an activity. And yet this is what design and marketing is suggesting for all who want to experience creativity. There's so many products and markets for creativity, as many as there are for living. And just as living is set up to be something creative, you can say, for example, that workbenches look like furniture or calligraphy sets look like accessoires for your living room. Many creative products are very very much emphasize their material and are created in a non-finito sort of way. And they are, again, screens that you can project your desires onto, thanks to their structure of purposefulness without purpose. So if you want to experience actively living, you will suddenly feel creative forces. But as soon as being creative becomes a target. They can't experience it particularly well anymore as you can experience living. Whatever you're doing right now, there's this feeling that being creative is actually something slightly different. I just need two minutes and then I'll be done. So living and creativity have been the object of d people's desires long before design and marketing made every verb a dynamic activity. But all the same, the corresponding wishes have definitely been stimulated by these products that were designed especially for this purpose, considerably so. And since they have this sort of delay delayed gratification, they always have this sense of a promise in the future. And as a result, they trigger a sense of unrest because they suggest to people again and again they could live, they could reside in a place properly, they could be creative. and if they weren't so worried about the fact that something was missing. And so their own flat doesn't feel cozy enough. It, they've, you feel that you're too passive, too boring. You fear deficits for which earlier generations didn't even have a concept. And this is why you continue to search persistently and hopelessly for what it is that could ease this deficit. But at the end of the day, you pay for your wishes by remaining unrelieved of them. So designers and poets who want to make reality even more real create new fears and worries. So you really do have to learn how to live, but not the way Heidegger's demanding we do. Instead of just focusing on a design that can make every verb into a dynamic activity, we need to have a design that will relieve the burden that people have from all of these imperatives. It would be, there needs to be design that makes it possible to do lots of different things indifferently without having to experience something, without coming into this mode of the professional, the exclusive, without having this pressure to experience something. What we need is design that doesn't give a damn about verbs. Only then will we be able to get away from this sense of deficit, and then perhaps we will finally learn that Dingsal can be something beautiful. Thank you.